We're always told to take opportunities, but what if we could make them as well, rather than just waiting for them to come along? In year seven, I was diagnosed with severe dyslexia. This came as a massive shock, although, to be honest with you, I should have probably seen it coming. The first version of this speech, for example, was covered in spelling mistakes, unknown to me, but thankfully highlighted in all their glory by Microsoft Word. I felt as if a part of me was broken. I felt that I might never be able to explore the universe if I had such reliance on squiggly red lines. I think one of my teachers from high school must have caught on to this concern and suggested that for my next project, instead of writing an essay, I instead produce my own video documentary. I left it until the very last minute, used literally every one of the Windows Movie Maker stock transitions, recorded the audio in my bathroom, and took the music from YouTube. It was a terrible video, but at the same time, some of the best fun I'd ever had. Soon, I was making videos for all of my different classes, for my English book reviews, science lab reports, and even in maths for a geometry project. Nowadays, I use the medium of video to share my curiosity for the world around us. I've taken my camera deep underground to discuss colonizing Martian caves. I've gone into the hulls of long dead warships to teach students about engineering design, and I've even traveled to the most northern town on Earth to learn more about extreme agriculture. I took the part of me that was broken, the part that doesn't know how to spell, and made it irrelevant. No one cares if the words inside my head are spelt wrong when I'm talking to you directly through the medium of video. Five years and countless documentaries later, I was about to apply for my next stage in education. I knew that I wanted to go to university to study aerospace engineering. Rockets are how we get to space, the next great frontier, and a place I'm immensely curious about. So I was disappointed to find out that Perth doesn't offer that sort of degree. I didn't have the money to travel interstate, so I wrote to UWA to see if they could make a special space course just for me. Well, as it turns out, I can't really write, so I made a video. Despite driving myself all the way up to the Pinnacles National Park to get just the right kind of alien-looking landscape, as it turns out, 17-year-olds don't get to decide university curriculums. <laughs> so instead, I specialized in mechanical engineering. I found out from one of the students whom I tutor that my old high school was about to send a contingent on a NASA space camp. I encouraged him to take the opportunity, but at the same time was a little bit disappointed that I'd never had this opportunity for myself. Except I thought, what if I made the opportunity? I found the company running the event and asked to see if they needed any local Perth people to help bridge the cultural gap between southern USA and Western Australia. A couple of interviews and one excruciating 25-hour plane trip later, I had a job with the NASA Outreach Program. Now, I wasn't just listening to an astronaut deliver a presentation, I was helping her to set up the slideshow, talking to her while do it, and being paid for it. From these discussions, I found out that mechanical and aerospace engineering actually share some very common roots. For example, we just used Bernoulli's principle to show how water flows over a dam. If I was in an aerospace unit, I'd be using almost exactly the same maths, but looking at air over an airplane wing. I was getting much of the background theory for an aerospace degree, but without any of the application. Time to make some more opportunities. In mid-2018, a group of space geeks, myself included, decided to do just that by creating a new club, UWA Aerospace. We were going to compete in the inaugural Australian University's rocketry competition by launching a four kilogram payload on a rocket to a height of 10,000 feet. That's about 3.05 kilometers, or 13 times the height of the BHP building, Perth's tallest skyscraper. Despite sinking way too many hours into Kerbal Space Program, a sort of gamified version of NASA where you get to design and launch spacecraft, none of us had any idea how to actually go about building a rocket. What sort of fuel would we use? Where could we launch it? And what do fins actually do? There weren't any courses to take, so we made our own. We talked to experts at UWA, 
Our teachers, who, while they didn't know much about building rockets, were experts in the field of running simulations and knew a lot about material properties. We joined the West Australian Rocketry Society, a group of black powder-coated rocketry enthusiasts who were more than willing to share their craft. We now had a solid launch pad, time to take off. There are three key stages of rocketry, launch, flight, and landing. For launch, we use a solid rocket motor embedded in the bottom of the rocket. We get these from Oz Rocketry, which, as it turns out, is the only way you can get rocket fuel in Australia if you don't want to appear on all the wrong sort of government watch lists. <laughs> I was an early member of the Aerostructures sub-team. It's our job to make sure the rocket can fly through the air. My specific role was in designing a nose cone, which helps us to cut cleanly through. The avionics and recovery teams are tasked with assessing flight data in order to deploy a parachute at just the right time. Theirs is probably the most important job on the team, other than the guy bringing donuts and coffee. Let me now introduce you to the flagship rocket of UWA Aerospace, whom we affectionately call Finley. Finley is a two meter long fiberglass rocket with a dry mass of just under nine kilograms. We hoped he'd be able to reach the 10,000 foot altitude to compete in Queensland. Now, the product of countless evenings and weekends of design, testing, and building was on the launch pad, ready to take off. Accelerating at almost 10 Gs, he quickly reaches a speed of 200 meters per second. Here's the view inside the rocket now. We're taken off, and you can see we're starting to spin. But that's OK, although it does remind me to retroactively warn any of you who suffer from motion sickness, you should have probably started looking away about 10 seconds ago. We're now coming up on Apogee, which is the highest point in the flight. The goal was 10,000 feet, but as you saw, we only reached about 7,500. We're now on our way back down, and the parachute has been deployed. I'm going to skip us through the next 90 seconds of travel to see Finley gracefully return to Earth. Bang! OK, th that, that wasn't meant to happen. Here's what we arrived to 15 minutes later when we found him. Finley's lifeless body lay strewn across a field. <laughs> Something terribly, terribly wrong had happened. Despite all of our calculations and simulations, something hadn't worked out right. The parachute didn't deploy properly. Now, our pride and joy lay dead at our feet, a 20 centimeter gash along the front. No chance of a reattempt. As we were about to break out the uh, grape juice and drown out our sorrows, we got thinking a little bit more about the rocket. Even before we'd crashed into the landscape, we still had failed to reach altitude. To do that, we would need to be traveling faster, which meant a much lighter rocket. But that didn't matter, right? It was broken. No chance of a reattempt. It got me thinking. Not that long ago, I too had been told that I was broken. I had dyslexia I wouldn't be able to spell. Except I've managed to go pretty OK without spelling. I took the part of me that couldn't spell things and made it unnecessary by making videos. No one cares I can't spell when I'm making a documentary. Perhaps we could do something similar with Finley. Sure, the front section was broken, but the rest was OK. We worked late into the night, reconfiguring our flight simulations, rejigging the electronics, and removing the destroyed front. By dawn, a much smaller, much lighter rocket was ready to take off. Finley Reborn flew to an altitude of 9,314 feet, just a couple of percent away from our target altitude. We had snatched a victory from the jaws of defeat. With the team now experienced in the ups and downs of rocketry and excited to learn more, we set our eyes onto the next big challenge. Our rockets had been mostly self-funded, so we wanted to find a way to help subsidize these $1,000 projects. Space is already a billion-dollar industry, and it's only expected to grow. Perth even has a few space companies, but at this point, they're all still in the startup phase. We could ask them for some sponsorship, but they were only just keeping themselves afloat. They didn't have enough money to just give to us. When I was elected project manager, I thought that maybe we could make the opportunity and see if we could work with these companies. So let's pretend that you're a new startup space company, 
and you want to launch a satellite which knocks out space junk by throwing rocks at it. It's a pretty good idea. However, before you send up an actual satellite to do this for real, you need to know it's actually going to work. Simulations can only get you so far, as we found out in Queensland. So you need to test it out. One way of doing this is by setting up a model of your rocket in a reduced gravity aircraft. It flies in a parabolic curve in order to provide a couple of seconds of freefall. Affectionately nicknamed the Vomit Comet, seats can typically cost about $5,000. It's cheaper than going to space, but still way out of the budget of many early startups. But if you're just setting up a model of your satellite and you only need ground microgravity for a couple of seconds, then why are we wasting money on special airplanes? If we send our rockets just a little bit higher and deploy the parachute a bit later on the way back down, we too can provide the same microgravity exposure. This produces better, more experienced student engineers, while also giving back to the local space economy. Just last month, we made our first real steps towards this goal, launching our first supersonic rocket to an altitude of just under five kilometers. Our next step is increasing altitude even further. It doesn't matter if you aren't given the opportunity to pursue your passion. Often when you're working in new frontiers, these opportunities just don't exist yet. But by making your opportunities, responding to failure, like I did with my dyslexia and the team were able to do with Finley, and by taking some pretty amazing people along for the ride, we can pursue the impossible. Thank you.